Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Mara Fine. I'm the program manager here at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm really pleased to bring you today um, this great program about project-based learning from some great professionals working in the field and from folks who are funding the field. So we're going to learn a lot with them today. I want to ask that you all mute yourselves if you haven't already been muted by me so that we can limit the number of distractions that we have. You can ask questions at the end um, by either chatting them to me or emailing them to me if you have some trouble. Um, I will keep an eye on my email. Um, so again, welcome. Just a word about JFN. Um, our mission is to bring the funders together so that they can make a greater change in the world together through their philanthropy. Um, each of our programs throughout the year is based in one of our JFN values. Um, this one sort of covers all of them, but I, I want to say that especially it's about partnership, Arevut, where all of us doing this work together, different funders doing different work, different um, professionals doing different work. And with that in mind, um, Susan Cardos from Avichai is going to uh, lead us through this. Uh, not Avichai, I'm so sorry. That's not where you work at all. <laughs> Susan, yes it is. Susan Cardos is going to be leading us through this. And um, just a word about Susan. Uh, she's the Senior Director and Strate of Strategy and Education Planning at Avichai. And she's been facilitating the 10-year spend down for Jewish day schools, oversees the implementation of the strategy. Um, she used to work for a CJP, and she's been working tirelessly on this with us and is going to give us the bio information for the folks who are going to be speaking with us today, um, talk to us a little bit about why Avichai funds this work, why they think it's so important, and how we can move this forward um, throughout the many years to come. So without further ado, Susan, please take it away. Uh, thanks. Mayrav, can you switch the slide, please? Um, hi, everybody. Welcome, and thanks for your uh, attendance. I hope this will be a great session for us. I'm going to speak as little as possible. Um, I just want to sort of start us off with a frame for problem-based learning, just so that we all can sort of get into the, um, into the uh, webinar with a, with a common understanding, and I'm sure that the speakers will uh, deepen it as we go through the webinar. Um, very simply, problem-based learning is an inquiry-based learning methodology that requires groups of students to work together to solve real problems. Um, the, the thing that's great about problem-based learning is that it helps students develop critical 21st century skills. And by that, I mean problem definition, problem solving, collaboration, learning independence, uh, and critical thinking. Um, why should Jewish ed educators and Jewish day schools care about problem-based learning, or PBL? Um, from my perspective, simply because Jewish day schools should offer top-notch education programs in both Jewish and general studies that help students learn content and develop 21st century skills, full stop. I mean, we should be offering the best possible programs, and so we should know about uh, innovations and actually old programs that become new again through a focus on personalized learning. Um, Problem-based learning is one possible way for teachers to personalize learning for students and provide them with opportunities to learn content and ways of thinking and doing needed uh, to thrive in today and tomorrow's world. Uh, you can switch the slide, Marav. Thanks. Um, at Avichai, we care about per, uh, problem-based learning, uh, and, and we want to know more about it and its implementation in Jewish day schools for exactly the reason that we are committed to um, top-notch Jewish day school excellence, and we believe that problem-based learning might be a very powerful way uh, to attain it. So I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, our experts. Um, let me just start with Tikva. Um, Tikva Wiener is the Chief Academic Officer at Mag and David Yeshiva High School in Brooklyn and is co-finder of IDEA Schools Network, which helps educators implement project-based learning and educational innovation. Tikma, Tikva became passionate about PBL through Real School, the inquiry-based student-driven learning program she founded in 2011 with her students at the Frisch School, and she holds an MA from Queens College in English Literature and Creative Writing. Dr. Jane Willoughby is the Vice President and Director of Education Program, Education Program Research and Development at the Center for Initiatives in Jewish Education. Dr. Willoughby has a wealth of experience in Jewish education and in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. Uh, in her most recent position, she was the Director of STEM Advancement 
uh, K-12 at the San Diego Jewish Academy, and she completed her PhD in the field of neurochemistry at St. Bartholomew's Medi Medical College at the University of London. And finally, uh, in 2015, Matt Williams moved to New York to finish the research for his dissertation on the history of Orthodox outreach. In the past year, Matt was appointed the managing director of the Berman Jewish Policy Archive, now located at Stanford, and is in the midst of consulting projects on Jewish education broadly defined with the Orthodox Union, J UJA Federation of New York, and the Abichai Foundation, the Idea Schools Network, and a number of other organizations. Matt studies a number of teaching methods, focusing in particular on those like PBL that potentially subvert traditional content authorities, such as the textbook and the teacher. Uh, and he's currently working on his dissertation at Stanford, as I mentioned. So, Tikva? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, May Rob, would you advance to this next slide? Why PBL? Um, thank you. I am so welcome, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is project-based learning. Um, I, uh, I often think of a T-shirt that I once saw, a kid, a very, I guess, insistent kid saying, um, was wearing a T-shirt that said on the front, what's the difference between apathy and ignorance? And um, on the back it said, I don't care and I don't know. Um, and I think about that sometimes because I really feel like um, I was noticing more and more over the last decade in, in, in my teaching career, um, and I've been in Jewish education for about 20 years now, um, that it was getting harder and harder to engage students. Um, they're slouched, you know, in their chairs, and they're behind their computers doing all sorts of things, but it seemed to me that they were doing lots and lots of things that weren't particularly related to the class. Um, and so one of the things that got me started in my PBL journey was, like, asking myself, what could I do to really engage the students? You know, what matters to them? And the other reason that I started on that journey was because I noticed more and more how much standardized testing was creeping into the curriculum, um, really kind of sucking the joy out of the curriculum. You know, we call it um, drill, kill. Um, bubble fill, you know, drill the content, kill curiosity, and then bubble fill the, you know, the bubble. Um, and the other part of it was that that kind of learning doesn't really create meaning for students because if the, if the meaning is that I'm going to take a test, um, that doesn't seem really all that relevant. Sorry, those are bells. Those are school bells. Um, the meaning doesn't really seem all that relevant to the students. And so for that reason, I really started to explore. Sorry, just one second. Um, so I really, sorry. Now you get it in the, 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 the real school experience. Um, so, um, so I really started to explore. Or, you know, what might engage my students, give them joy, and give them meaning in the classroom. And so one of the things that I did was I sort of peeked behind their computers and I started asking them, you know, what are you doing behind there? And the answer was really, sorry, the answer was really quite interesting. You know, a lot of the students were doing fashion or design or business, and they were engaging with the world in, like, really real-world ways. Um, some of the students were learning on a really deep level. They were deepening their own knowledge of the academic discipline that they were studying in school and going in directions that the standardized tests weren't able to give them. And so I thought about that, and I, was think and I thought, like, what could we do to really engage the students where they are and to ignite their passions? And what that also would do, would, do would, would enable the students to connect with the learning not only through their passions, but in all sorts of modalities. Because as we know, the traditional way of learning really kind of um, emphasizes text. It does a lot of text study. And if you're not good at text, um, then it really kind of excludes you. Um, and so instead of drilling on the deficit all the time, um, what project-based learning does by getting students where they are, by igniting, finding out what's interesting to them, uh, by finding out what kind of products or events um, or, you know, um, problems they want to create or solve, um, it really gets them thinking in a, multi, in a multiple modality kind of way. So they could be, they could be um, starting with their own interests and passions, 
going through course material and learning skills that they need to for any course, um, and producing um, products that are meaningful to them. Not only does that make the learning matter to them, but it makes the learning matter in the real world. Because if I have a student whose passion is business and I take them through history and I now show them the history of business and economic development, and he's got to solve a real world problem um, that's happening today in the, in the business world, in, the, in economic development, um, then suddenly I have authentic learning for the student and I have authentic learning in the real world. The other way that the learning becomes real is that we know today that um, the work environment is all about collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, my apologies again, um, creativity, and all of those things happen in a PBL unit. Um, for these reasons, and Mayrod, if you would go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, for these reasons, um, I started the Idea Schools Network because what I saw was I didn't just want to do this in my classroom, but I really wanted to connect with other educators who were thinking along the same lines. And so for the past four years, I started um, by, um, by doing a summer sandbox, which is, our, is the Idea Schools Network professional development conference during the summer. And um, I ran my first summer sandbox um, four years ago. And I actually ran it with the two students who I started real school with. Susan mentioned that I started um, a inquiry-based learning or project-based learning club at my previous school, Frisk. Um, and we had really kind of gotten very close. Um, with, I got very close with my students who had done it, and we ran the conference together. And we were educating educators about what was so great about the things we had done um, through real school. One of those things was a student-made um, fashion show where the students not only created, let's say, just the fashion, but also um, were involved in it. It basically became a living Dvar Torah, a living kind of a Torah, um, you know, a Torah kind of lesson um, where they took a socially conscious, uh, a, they were socially conscious, they took a social problem, they, they solved it, they raised money for it. So one year we did, um, we raised money to end slavery, and our, our theme was fair trade, fair, fair world, fair Fair food, fair trade, fair world. Um, who's the fairest of them all? So it fit in with the fashion theme. Um, and the kids were doing, um, were learning Torah. They were, um, they were creating, a, they were producing the show. So those who were interested in entrepreneurship and business were producing the show. Um, the kids who were who wanted to do design and fashion were obviously working with the clothes. The kids who were interested in the Torah were researching the Torah, and they all came together in this beautiful event for women. The fashion show. Other other students who were interested in delving deep into their Torah studies um, decided to do a, a student run Yomi Yun, a day of learning, where the students became the teachers. We had an artist Saint Midrash, where we created a living artistic Saint Midrash as well. And again, anyone who's interested in the entrepreneurship angle was able to run it from from behind the scenes and produce this event. So it's, so these kinds of events tapped into the abilities and passions of all the students. And it created meaning for the students as well. It also created um, a way for us to deepen Jewish values, not only by being socially conscious and showing how we can be a global Jew, but also by connecting Jewish text to whatever we were doing. And that was something that was really, really powerful. Um, and so while I started with my students four years ago, what, what evolved into the network, and two years ago I was fortunate enough to get the Joshua Venture Grant, um, and became a fellow, and that really allowed me to launch the network into another, um, you know, to grow the network. Um, and for the past two years, we've had um, an East and West Coast Summer Sandbox. We've now trained facilitators. Matt here is one of them. Um, we've now trained facilitators. We have 12 facilitators. Um, over the last two years, as you see on the slide, we've trained over, uh, over 800 teachers. Um, in our founding schools, one of which is Mag and David, which is the high school where I am now, um, we've implemented project-based learning units in all disciplines. Um, we've taken our teachers to the high-tech schools in San Diego, California, which had the high-tech schools are kind of like the gold standard of PBL. We've inspired the, the, the teachers by taking them there. Um, we've shown them how PBL is done by taking them there. Um, we continue to iterate here each year 
um, we deepen and make more rigorous our project-based learning units. Um, so whether it's a unit that a teacher does um, within one of her classes, or a unit that, or to, to create a whole year around a, what we call a driving question um, in project-based learning, um, that is um, that's what we've done. The components of the of the pedagogy um, mean that we um, organize content and skills around a larger idea that that the that the curriculum. Um, you know, that the curriculum is organized around. So, for example, in the ninth grade for this year, we're organizing the curriculum around identity and what does it mean, um, who am I, where did I come from, in biology it might mean how can I take better care of my ecosystem, in Judaic studies it might mean um, why should my Jewish identity be important to me, in Jewish prayer it would mean what, why should prayers be important to me. So at all times, we're always remembering not only um, what the student is good at doing, but also um, what's meaningful to the what's meaningful in the larger world, and how we can create really a kind of values-based um, education. And that's really what I think the uh, the pedagogy means to us in Jewish education. How do we organize curriculum not around a test score? Um, one of the first things we created actually in real school was a T-shirt that said, "I am more than a test score." So we're not only we're not organizing curriculum around a test score, but we're organizing curriculum around um, what um, is important to the student and what should be important to the Jewish people. Um, I'm going to segue to uh, to Jane here by mentioning one event that we did, which is the Maker Expo, where we we educated the community about um, project-based learning by having schools create interactive booths around STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and creativity. And that's another amazing part about PBL is the really unleashing student creativity. Um, and so, uh, so that expo, which was a, a Maker Fair-like event, was impacted, as you see here, um, over you know, um, about 1,200 people. Um, so it's been a great journey so far. Um, it really does change the way the students engage with the work and take ownership of the work, um, and it's been a lot of fun. Okay. Um, it's over to me now, Jane. Yes, Jane, go right ahead. Okay. All right. I'm just going to see if I can move this slide. Thank you very much, Tifa. That was that was really interesting. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really to be. It's really good to be on the phone with everybody to discuss this. Um, Project-based learning is a passion of mine, and I kind of came about it actually just naturally before I even knew that we called it project-based learning. So just to tell you a little bit about this, um, I've had over a decade experience in education, but prior to that, I actually worked in biotechnology and in academic research. And one of the reasons that I came into education was because um, having, having worked in industry, I wanted to bring my experience of industry into education. Um, I had noticed that when I had been hiring graduates um, from industry, as, you know, as a, uh, when I worked in biotech, when I was, in, like, was, uh, I was hiring graduates, that one of the concerns I had about the graduates coming in was their ability to problem solve and take ownership of projects that they were actually working on. So when I went into education, and I um, went into education at the San Diego Jewish Academy, I was able to look at the different kinds of learning style. And, um, hello? And I'm, is there somebody out there? Can you phone? mute yourself, Jane? Go ahead. Okay. Um, and, and I looked at the different types of teaching styles and could see why, in fact, it was that, uh, that uh, it, having this student in lots and lots of different schools, why it was that, in fact, this was happening. And that was because I was seeing students that were not engaged in the classroom. And the way I describe it is that the teacher had ownership over the classroom and over the education of the students, but the students seemed to have relinquished ownership of the education. It was very frontal frontal based teaching, the way I call it, and the teacher was responsible for disseminating the information. So over the years I developed several programs at the school that were very heavily based on project based learning. 
Um, and that's how I came. That's how I came about it. Um, and by and, and one of the things that you'll hear me speak a number of times today, while I'm talking about this, is for me, it's about transferring the transferring the ownership for the education from the teacher to the student. And that, for me, is what project-based learning does. It transfers transfers that ownership. Um, so I joined um, Center for Initiatives in Jewish Education um, you know, six months ago. I was very excited about their programs because they are project-based learning. Um, and the, the, really the direction for, for um, SIGE is, is really that they want to um, bring educational excellence into the Jewish day school system within the United States. And uh, project-based learning is their mode of operation um, in, in particular in their middle school and high school programs. Um, they want to provide an educational model why you want, where they use project-based learning that, that doesn't just function within the school, but it provides a skill set that lasts not just within the school framework, but it goes beyond the walls of the school. And these are skills that can be applied to anything during a student's life. So these skills that are actually taught should actually reach beyond the classroom and actually last a lifetime. And that's why they're very focused on giving these life skills to the students. Now we have a number of different programs that we incorporate project-based learning. And on my first slide, I've highlighted our high school engineering program. This is a program that is a STEM program. Um, it, it incorporates a number of different skills that are imparted. But it involves project-based learning in the following way. Uh, we run two years of our high school engineering program. Um, in our first year, um, it is a basic introduction to scientific engineering. And then in our second year, it's applied to biomedical engineering. Both years function in the same way. In our first semester, we use inquiry, problem, and project-based learning, where we are introducing our students to various knowledge bases, and they develop certain skill sets. So we provide the, we actually provide what I call the building blocks in the first semester, and we incorporate all three methods of learning. And then in our second semester, it is almost 100% devoted to project-based learning. Once these students have these building blocks in place, they are then launched into a project-based learning for a capstone project where they are driving the process where they develop a project or they develop a, a device that they will have engineered uh, that brings a benefit to somebody's life. And that is they are given the instructions, they're given a scaffold for um, using the design engineering process for how this project should progress so we don't throw them into it without anything. They've learned, this, they've learned these scaffolding techniques in their first semester. And then in using these scaffolding techniques, they then take ownership and then they then drive the project. Um, and then they pick up new skills on the way. And this is really the model that we have in our programming. We begin with inquiry, problem, and project. And then we move to project-based learning as the students move on and develop. Um, we do this in our programming for in our middle school and our high school program, um, uh, in, and also it's very successful in elementary school programs. And I've had experience in project-based learning all the way from kindergarten all the way through to 12th grade. Um, moving on to my next slide, um, these, are, these are some of the critical principles of project-based learning. Um, but you'll see that I've highlighted in here, and I'll come back to this time and time again. We're developing these critical life skills. They have to be. They have to involve critical thinking, collaboration, and self-management. These are inter and intra-personal life skills, and the student has to be the center of this and has to be directing the project-based learning. Um, many of the other elements that I have on this slide are also very important. You have to provide tuition time. Um, the projects have to be scaffolded so that they can be evaluated, and it has to be relevant and centered to the core curriculum. We are teaching the curriculum uh, uh, using this process. Oops, to. Um, project based learning for us is very important, as I've mentioned before. Um, it provides a much deeper and longer lasting learning opportunity. And in addition to that, um, you know, it provides skills uh, that are relevant to the workplace and the students are more engaged. Now, my, I, I've got two, two final slides that I want to finish with here. 
And this is from my personal experience with my students. Students that have worked with me on project-based learning, when they come back to me, say that they are actually more prepared for college. They actually move through the um, uh, process, they move through the college much, much faster because they develop skills. So they're more able to um, move through college faster. They're more able to take on opportunities. This is one of the impacts that we're looking for. And we have um, much, greater imp make much greater student self-confidence um, in their ability to tackle projects. And this is what it was all about. And this is what we're seeing in our students. Also, students that are expo exposed to this, we know, for example, um, that they're now considering careers in this area. So it's also engaged them and excited them about it. And then my final slide is, and, and I think since it's very relevant to our, um, our Jewish funders network, since they are considering these programming in schools, it's really important to finish on what are the challenges? And this is what I've highlighted here. I've been to the high-tech schools. I've been to the Nueva schools, the gifted schools. And the one of the challenges that teachers find is scope versus depth. How can I cover my curriculum versus depth? It's a balance. And how to evaluate these programs. With the sufficient professional development in this area, this can be achieved. So this is one of the things I would guide people. It has to be underpinned by professional development because you are changing the role of the teacher the teacher is now no longer the imparter of information. The teachers are becoming the coach, the facilitator in these classes. That's a huge change. And this is successful when there's a professional development. And at SIGE, that is one of the key things that we bring to this. We provide mentors in place throughout the year so the teachers that move into this not only are involved in, in um, teachers' training at the beginning of this, they are supported throughout the year as they trans in, transition into this role as facilitator and coach. Um, and, and that's really key to how these programs are successful. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to say today. I'm now going to trans I'm going to hand this over to Matt. And I am now going to be mute my phone. Thank you so much for your time for listening today. Thank you, Jane. Uh, hi, everybody. So, there's a real-world problem, there's sustained inquiry, there's student choice and ownership, there's alignment with curricular standards, and there's a public product that serves as a means of assessment. It sounds great. Um, I am myself a practitioner when I teach in college, um, but I'm also not an evangelist. I'm still suspicious, and I'm still, uh, I I'm still, let's say, concerned. Is it really a top-notch method of education, as Susan alluded to, or is it just the latest fad in schools? And I think that's a really important question because that's the question that I hear from a lot of teachers and a lot of administrators. Um, and so really I've undertaken um, through the Obvious High Foundation uh, a research project to assess to some extent or to begin the assessment of does PBL work? Um, and what follows uh, should give you a little bit of context for that question. Um, and I'm happy to follow up individually or further on if you have any specific questions. Um, so by work, whenever we ask a question, what is when what does an educational intervention, does it work? We have to really define what work means. Um, these are the most common definitions that I hear throughout Jewish day schools, um, which are, uh, and, and I actually ordered these in their proper order, the amount of times that I hear them. Um, one is to enhance academic achievement. Does this method do that? Um, the other one is, does it channel students to the best colleges? Um, and really, that's often full stop. And then some administrators and teachers will be like, oh, yeah, for each individual student. And then the third thing is, does it socialize them into the norms and values of their given or their particular Jewish community? In other words, does it make more Jews in the way that they want it to make more Jews? That's what it often means when we say work. There are a lot of other definitions, but those are the ones that I hear most often. Um, we can go to slide 12, too, or next. So to give you a little bit of context for answering a question like that, um, there's existing research, and it's a really and it's the best place to start always. Um, so regarding um, the first one and the second one, um, academic, uh, academic quality and college preparedness, um, the factors that matter are often well beyond the purview of the school. Um, so number one, clearing away is parent socioeconomic status. This is all uh, United States specific. Um, two is race or it is parents' level of education, you have to get down to number 11 um, in a list of variables, and this is based off of the research of Sean Reardon and Eric Bettinger, and I'm happy to provide bibliographies if you'd like. Um, 
Uh, you have to get down to a number 11, planning and development time um, given to teachers over the amount of time they're in class or the instructional time. Um, in other words, it's better for students that teachers are in the building planning for longer um, and teaching in the classroom less. So that's an advocate uh, that advocates for, let's say, three to four classes for a teacher a day as opposed to five to six, which is what most Jewish day school teachers are, are saddled with. Um, so you have to get down to number 11 to find something that a school can actually do to affect educational achievement. Uh, factors regarding uh, the letter C or the socialization into a particular Jewish community um, also don't necessarily start with the school. Parents' commitment, um, social repercussions and expectations, social capital and status, and role models. Um, some of those are absolutely uh, find themselves in schools, but also sometimes not so much. So if we move on to slide 13, um, the question becomes, what are PBL's effects in this larger infrastructure or this larger context? So it could be that PBL is a contributing factor. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, let's say PBL classes necessarily involve more planning time. Um, that means that teachers are spending more time planning, which is better for students, right? It also could be a proxy factor. So the school that I'm doing research in now, Mag and David, um, it, it, uh, for example, it's a super entrepreneurial community. So PBL, since it sometimes and often stresses the entrepreneurial nature of the students, this could be called culturally relevant pedagogy, which means that the community's values align very closely with the method's values too. Um, it also may be a narrow intervention. In other words, we have to ask, who are these effects for? Um, and I'm really interested in project-based learning in two particular types of sort of groups or samples. Um, one is the conversation we're having broadly in education about the end of men, um, which really is a reference to the increasing dropout rate in middle school um, and disengagement rates for boys who get interested in video games, among other things. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's actually becoming a serious problem and serious uh, for uh, larger education researchers and communities and organizations to study. And the second uh, sort of interest uh, I, am, I, I have in terms of sample population are the mental health of women who actually often do succeed in a traditional school, but it, at, at some cost. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that later too. Um, and the last thing is that it might not actually have a significant uh, or at least effect for this particular population. Um, that is Jewish day school students. Um, there's a number of, of uh, research uh, pieces that are coming out of high tech high right now, um, which it does show um, serious and significant um, positive gains for their particular community. But their particular community, the ones that they're serving, and bar, are by and large um, poor, um, regular public school students. Um, that's not necessarily the group that we're working with in Jewish education. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what to do with PBL in this context. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, 14, just this is a very brief, like 30,000 foot overview of research design. So in order to figure out which it is, in other words, what project-based learning effects are in this particular context, um, you have to isolate it in some way, to some extent, and have, in order to have a comparison. Or the way that you do it is, is through a comparison with something else, pardon me. Um, in order to actually isolate it, you have to really know what questions to ask and what to look for when you're studying it. In order to do that, you, have, you develop a profile of PBL that highlights its unique characteristics. So that's what I'm actually doing right now. If you go to slide 15, is I'm at Megan David Yeshiva High School doing an in-depth ethnographic qualitative and quantitative study, a mixed method study, on whether or not, or what, trying to develop a profile for project-based learning in a Jewish day school. So I have three questions that are guiding this particular study. I've listed them here. Um, and instead of reading them out, it's basically, um, what are the nature of the projects? What are the types of Jewish conversations that are going on in a PBL class? And one that I'm particularly interested that Susan mentioned in my bio um, is what's the relationship between choice and obligation within this context? In other words, when you have a traditionally orthodox environment that uh, is the one I'm researching in, which is contingent upon the maintenance of specific types of authorities, 
what happens when you give students choice and ownership in that environment? Uh, I think it's a really important question when considering Jewish education broadly, too, um, considering the social expectations that we have in a variety of different denominational and communal groups. Um, and that's it for now, and I will send it back to Susan for discussion and guiding questions. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Matt. So I um, had initially listed out a few guiding questions that I thought might be uh, particularly good for us to start with, but I, I'm, I'm actually not sure they're the right questions now based on sort of the thoroughness uh, with, with which we heard from our, from our speakers. If people have access to the chat, um, I have been logging um, possible questions in the chat, so I welcome you to look there. Um, and with that, I will pass back to Mirav to, um, to work the technology for our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you all. Our presenters were phenomenal. Thank you guys for all of that information and the in-depth um, seriousness with which you took this. Um, the, the couple of questions that we have right now up on the, the slides can be a starter. Um, as Susan said, we really did get a pretty deep uh, conversation. So um, I'm looking at the chat right now to see if anyone has any questions they want to type into me. I'm also looking on my email if for some reason your chat isn't working. Um, you can shoot me an email and I'm taking a look at that now. If we don't have questions from the group, uh, I think we should start with um, some of the ones that um, Susan was sending out, which I think will add a little bit more to it. So Susan, if you want to start with the first one we have, um, what, if anything, should we give up in terms of serious text study if we move to more PBL and Jewish studies? Just to clarify, it wasn't should we give up. I meant to write what, if anything, do we give up? Ah, yes. Okay. Um, I am um, just tick that off. Um, it's funny because we, we talk about this a lot. A lot of people think that, you know, one of the misconceptions about PBL is that people think we're not going to do text study or we're not going to do serious building of text skills in PBL. Um, and that's not the case. You know, as both, um, as all three of us really said, um, you build your PBL units around the content and skills you want you want students to have. Um, it's in addition to you add this. Let, let's say what we call the success skills, such as you know um, what uh, Jane was talking about. You know, collaboration, time management, and so forth. Um, to that, in one school that we worked with actually last year, um, you know, this is the kind of conversation that you often hear. PBL will often challenge you to think about why you're actually teaching a particular curricular unit. Um, so, for example, you know, one, one, one set of fourth grade teachers in one of the schools that we were working with last year started debating, well, we, we teach Shmuel, right? We have to teach Samuel. And, um, and we have to get to the end because we have to tell people that he dies. And then one of the administrators says, well, what if we just told the kids at the beginning of the next year he dies? You know, so the, the, the shift, I think, becomes, and, and we're used to looking at curriculum from a sense of we're teaching, you know, American history or Shmuel. And the shift is we're teaching an, an interesting question that we think students want to answer. Um, and what Jane talked about in terms of transferring that ownership to the students. So we may not get to the end of the book in the same traditional way, but it doesn't mean that we're not doing the, the things that we think are most important, you know, about the book. And in fact, we're, we're doing, we're adding to the student's um, learning experience by making it relevant to them. Do you give up some content? Yes, you do. Um, because the learning is slower and it goes deeper. Um, so you do have to make those tough calls, but you're always making tough calls in education. That's what curriculum planning is. Thank you so much, Tikva. Um, do do any of the other folks have something to add? Jane, perhaps. Yeah, I, I actually do. I, I think this is, you know, I think this just doesn't this doesn't just apply to Jewish education. I think it applies to the the application of project project based learning across right across the board. So I, I've seen it where I've seen schools where it's 100 percent project based learning, and then I've seen schools where they balance it. Um, 
And I'm not sure what the right approach is. Um, I was at the high-tech schools, and I actually, when I was there, I actually asked them about this. And they were aware of it because when our, school, when our students leave our schools, they'll go to a yeshiva or they'll go to a university. And that doesn't necessarily mean that where they go, there is going to be just project-based learning. So it's actually, we actually want to make sure we prepare our students so they can also function in their secondary, post-high school um, educational uh, surroundings. And if you move to a situation, for example, such as high tech high, where it's 100% project-based learning, there are challenges when these students leave there if it's 100%. Because although I'm not an advocate for test, you know, drill and kill testing all the time, they then actually go into a college and they actually have to start doing tests. Um, and there is more traditional teaching. So it, this balance is not just, it doesn't just relate to um, this question here about, you know, what in tech study, if we move, what are we missing? Um, it's also a balance that also relates to when, when they leave their high schools, where they are going, and making sure that we give them a broad range of skills that they can cope with. And Matt talked about this as well in his presentation. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it relates to, to that aspect as well. And so getting this balance right of scope versus project-based learning um, is also very critical in, in going forward. Yeah, I want to add to what Jane said because we, when we were talking to Larry Rosenstock, who runs the high tech schools, you know, he talks about preparing his students for the tests that matter, and they're all given, you know, SAT and ACT prep. Um, and um, he says, you know, do I think it's a good idea to do a math problem in three minutes? No, but tough no is on us because that's what the kids have to do um, to get into college. Um, so, you know, that's what we have to do. We always have to be mindful, not only, I mean, Larry talks also about the fact that, you know, he always wants his students to understand why they're learning something, not to be told, well, you'll, you know, this will be important when you grow up 25 years from now or maybe never. But, you know, he always wants them to understand why they're learning and that that does have to be balanced with, they also have to get ready for the SAT. Thank you, guys. We have a question from uh, the group. Um, if PBL is based on students' interests, are there obstacles in terms of ensuring that all students are being challenged and maximizing their potential? Um, sure. What, what, what the PBL classroom allows, because also remember that your classroom is now not, you know, the teacher at the front of the room and um, the, the students following basically the, the job of, you know, the, the, the guide of the teacher you know, they're not following the teacher. What they're doing is you're able to sort of divide the, the classroom into subgroups. Um, so the student who is, you know, the student or students who are at a very advanced level and can really do work, you know, are delving deep, deep into, you know, text. And, you know, I saw this with my own eyes, you know, are able to do that and bring that back to, um, you know, their projects and whatever they, whatever products they create. Um, at the same time, you can also scaffold students who perhaps, you know, struggle more um, with certain skills or content acquisition, um, and you can get them to where they need to be. Um, one also interesting aspect of, um, of that kind of classroom is that, you know, one of the teachers, um, the, the head of student services who uh, presented to the Board of Ed on PBL at, at a school we were working with, um, talked about the fact that one of her students who really struggled in the more traditional classroom suddenly she went to the maker space, which is an area where kids can create and, you know, use technology or just, you know, create whatever they want. And suddenly that kid showed an off the charts ability, you know, in spatial reasoning. Um, so you also don't, you don't know what you're missing when you're only testing kids or, you know, and assessing kids in, in one certain way. Uh, when you open up the classroom to these different modalities, suddenly kids get to shine in all these different ways. Um, so that's also what you gain, um, you know, what you gain from that. But um, but you can, you know, it's literally, you know, you know, educate the child according to his or her way. Can I, can I also jump in? I actually think, this is Jane, I actually think that project-based learning is more suited to, um, 
addressing to providing a means of learning that that it can move to different levels of stu student skills because the projects will move to a depth depending on the student skills. And, 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 that, and so I found, that in fact, that's one of the benefits of it. Um, and, and exactly um, as Tickler was saying, I have seen students in a classroom who have just not been engaged in the process suddenly come to life um, because this is not, because they just do much better in a situation where they can be in the driving seat and they can drive it at their own at their own level and at their own speed. And so my feeling is this is a perfect opportunity to ha to be able to address different levels, different different uh, different students with different with different needs. So yeah, I think this is perfect for it actually. Yeah, I'll add one more thing too, which is that uh, traditional classrooms are actually particularly unresponsive in this regard. Uh, when you're a teacher in a traditional classroom, you're often told to aim middle high. Uh, I've talked to hundreds of teachers. I have no idea what that means still. Uh, Project-based learning promises, at least, a degree of flexibility for the student to run the project and for the teacher to actually assess the skill levels in real time. Um, and to also allow for each student to pursue his or her own interests within the context of curricular standards and goals. So that's, that's what it promises to do and, and how in many ways it could very, very well outshine traditional classrooms. Thank you guys. Um, we haven't gotten too many more from the folks on the call. Uh, so I'd like to go back to one of Susan's um, questions about necessary school structures that need to exist to implement project-based learning. Um, the question was, what necessary school schedule school structures need to exist, such as block scheduling, et cetera, and how to create some flexibility around that? Hmm. Yeah, you, you really have to rethink your whole it, – it forces you to rethink everything. One of the first things Mag and David did was go into block scheduling um, because you just – in order to do this, like you're just getting started in a 40-minute period and you just – you want to get – you want the kids to really have project time um, to really get into the project. Um, the other thing is that you really have to um, – and this is one of the things we do in the network a lot is – you really have to create a culture of change. The administration has to be really bought into what you're doing, um, because if they're not, then um, you know it's it's going to be dead on arrival. You um, the the te teachers can innovate in their own classrooms. Sorry, we're not we're still not we're not high tech high yet. They don't have bells or books. Um, the um, the teachers can innovate. Teachers can innovate within their classrooms, but if you really want systemic change. Um, you, you have to address it from an administrative level. Um, what we've done, the way we've done it um, when we've done training is to take a cohort of teachers, um, and the most successful model so far has been a self-selected group um, so that they're invested in change. They, wanna be, they want change. And some of the teachers, you know, when you do this, are going to leave. They're going to say, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Um, I want to be, you know, I want to teach the way I want to teach, and that has to be okay also, either to make room in your school for those teachers and to say, okay, that's fine, or to say, you know, no, we're, we're committed to this and, and we need you to be on board. And as we've seen a lot of schools that are really committed to this kind of change, you know, not just project-based learning, it's all types of educational innovation, and you really, it's the work of the administration to really foster that culture of change and to create a lot of positivity around it. Um, you know, one of the, at the Summer Sandbox this year, uh, one of the teachers who works with, who works with um, teachers in training, she said, um, I feel like all the teachers say no. They have to get out all their no's before they can say yes. And I, and I thought that that was like a really great um, way of saying it because I really do think that you're going to hear a lot of no and you just have to figure out how to, um, what the no is really about, you know, fear of change, fear of change of the religion, you know, that's a big one in Jewish education. Like if I do this, the whole... The the whole students, please come down. Sorry, I lost 
Shane? Or yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, it was Sigva. Sigva? Actually, yeah, this is Jane. I, when Tick was finished, I also wanted to come in because there are some other points associated with this that I wanted about this that I wanted to raise. Go ahead, Jane. Okay. Um, it, it, it is a very it is a very different role that a teacher has. Um, the classroom looks very different. Obviously, scheduling is very important. You actually have, to, and you have to have buy-in. You can put this out there, but the teacher has to believe in it in order for this to work. So there has to be a lot of professional development. But it's not just the teacher, actually. You know, I, I've seen project-based learning, and the teachers bought into it. But not just the teachers. If you are going to move to project-based learning, you also have to educate the students and the parents about what's going on in your classroom. Because in my experience of this, if you, move, if, you put, if you put this into a class where it's been traditionally taught with test, 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 and now you have students who are wanting to get to a good college, they're looking at their GPA, now they're in a role where it's a very different mode of assessment. Perhaps the scope is being covered in a very different way. You know, educating them, they begin to feel very uncomfortable. They're very used to being assessed by test and test only. They have to be educated, and their parents have to be educated. So the whole ecosystem of that classroom and then ultimately the school, for this to be successful, that entire ecosystem has to be educated. They all have to be educated about what you're doing. And I think, it, and you can do that, but you have to get their buy-in. And if you do this without their buy-in, then you encounter problems further down. And I didn't put that on my slide, but it was as Tipa was talking, I, it was one of the things that I really wanted to stress educating the entire ecosystem. I have one more question um, I want to pose, is that from a funder's perspective, um, actually, I, I suppose this would be for Susan. Um, from a funder's perspective, what more can, um, can folks like Tikva and Jane provide um, to show the need for support, and how can how can JFN and how can funders engage in the conversation better? Like we can see all of these positive, um, all, all of these positive ways that PBL can change the way that Jewish Day School works. But like the question is, is like what can funders do beyond just you know writing a check? How can we help them to understand why this matters and how this can um, promote better, more cohesive, more 360 degree sort of Jewish education? Right. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to be a satisfying answer, but in terms of um, what can, can JFN or the, or the practitioners themselves do, um, you know, to sort of get funders on board, my only good answer is you have to ask funders because uh, each funder is very different and what they consider um, evidence that something works or how they move things that they're learning about into their bullseye. It's very different and unfortunately a little bit quirky, you know, funder to funder. For, for us, um, we are um, making pretty big investments in personalized learning, um, particularly in the area of blended and online learning. Um, we have been very interested in problem-based learning. I attended the East Coast Summer Sandbox and got to see Tikva Wiener um, in action um, and got to sit with the 70 or 90 um, teachers who had you know, given up three or four days in their summer to go um, and sit in a, in a school classroom to learn about how to implement and to get real practical um, workshop experience creating a PBL unit and figuring out how to implement it in their classroom. It was very, very impressive. Um, so for us, um, you know, one thing that we're really interested in is you know, finding out uh, from, from a kind of third-party researcher, in this case in the, in the form of Matt Williams, who's also on the line, um, to understand better um, what, what PBL implementation looks like in one particular school context. And as I put in the, in the chat, I mean, the, the effectiveness of any uh, school intervention is really um, context-specific.
specific and implementation dependent. And, and that will always be the, the answer to any research question about inter education interventions. Like, you know, it depends. Depends on the, it, it's effective depending on the context in which it's implemented and the way in which it's implemented. So for us, we, we are working together with Matt and Tikva to identify research questions. And for other funders, it's going to be very specific. I, I think this is actually a really big problem mm -hmm. um, because I think that um, all of the great educators who are involved in Jewish education don't have the time to figure out funder by funder what they all need. And um, I don't have a solution, only just to point out the problem. I, I don't think, it doesn't make sense to me that it's a responsibility of, a, of an educator with a great idea you know, to go funder to funder and repackage their idea in right. 20 different ways to find out whether funders are interested. So I, I mean, I put that out there as a, as a, a critique of foundations, including uh, the one that I love and work for. Um, and you know, I just leave that out there as a, as a question. Well, thank you, Susan, for that, for that honesty. Um, and thank you all for participating. We're out of time. Um, so thank you all for being here. Can't we end on a better note than, than the one I just <laughs> well, ended on? What we're, what we're ending on is, look, there's work to be done, um, and, and that matters, right? It's, it's, it's important for funders to hear you know, that, that you know, folks aren't sure how to, how to get the word out that this really matters, that this is a way to affect change in the way that we're educating generations of uh, Jewish students, of you know, future Jews, and it's important for us to be taking that into consideration as we're looking at projects to fund and, you know, board meetings coming up and, and all of the like. I also think it's right. very relevant to think about as we're entering the holiday season, you know, we're thinking about ways that we can affect change moving forward, like what is Teshuvah? Mm -hmm. can, can we turn that around and, and use that for good in the community? I think it's a beautiful way to end. It's to end with a question, an education webinar is perfect. <laughs> uh, from my perspective. So thank you so much, Susan, for your, your care and your time. This was wonderful. And thank my you pleasure. also, Tikva and Matt and Jane. You guys were so phenomenal. We all learned so much. If you have any questions, folks who are on the call, feel free to contact me. I can connect you to any of the speakers. Um, this will also be recorded, um, as you know. And so um, we will be disseminating that. You can listen to it and send it to friends if, if they were interested in hearing uh, what went on. And we look forward to hearing from more of you. And if I don't see you or hear from you, uh, have a happy New Year and um, hug some Max. So we'll all be in touch soon. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you.